brought in Edwin Kagan, who is the current National Legal Director of American Atheists, to talk to us. The subject of the talk is the American Religious Civil War. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Edwin first. He is the founder of Camp Quest. It's a secular summer camp for children. He is one of the founders of the Free Inquiry Group of Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati. And he's author, also an author. He has copies of his books, the book, The Bottle of Blasphemy, for sale for $20. And he's also been a contributor to Kim Blake's Fundamentals of Extremism, The Christian Right in America. He was awarded the honor of Atheist of the Year by American Atheists. Um, He's one of the founders of the Recover Resources Center, and he is a member of the National Advisory Board for the Secular Student Alliance, our affiliate group. So without further ado, Edwin Kagan. What a marvelous introduction. Well, good evening, Senator. Good evening. Uh, I, I will say I expect a larger audience, but this simply modifies what we do a bit, okay? And what we're going to do, I think, is have more of a conversation tonight than a talk, if that's okay with you. Um, China mentioned, and I never heard the name China until I met China. I'm sure there are lots of Chinese around there. Yeah. Good she mentioned the reason rally. Now, Jim and I just went to this again, by the way, from our group in Louisville. We got Louisville, Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati. I'm space continuum, probably. The reason rally. On March 24th, it was the largest gathering of non-belief persons in the history of the world. There were estimates from between 20,000 and 26,000, and it was pouring rain. So we got over 20,000 non-believers out in the rain to show that they were in some harmony with one another, and I wrote a poem to go with that that will be published in the next issue of the American Atheist Magazine, which I will now read to you to set forth my view of this event. We are here to make history, to say we do not like to be punished if we do not believe in your God of love. We do not want to be denied the right to sit on juries or to take an oath to tell the truth. We do not want to be barred from public office because we do not believe as you believe. Because we reject a supernatural world that you embrace. Know thou, know now our fellow citizens who do not trust us. We are the most despised group in America. We are not believed in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Today we stand to say enough. Here we are. Look at us. We are those evil atheists and other fellow travelers among you whom you fear without reason, against whom you discriminate without cause. We are those whom you injure by hatred. There is nothing special about atheists. We have families and jobs and children and grandchildren. We are here and we are part of we the people, a big part, more than you know more than you would believe. Atheists are on their feet and off their knees to come out to tell you they do not believe that it is okay to be an atheist, that it is okay not to believe in God, because our nation was set up that way. We only ask that you do not continue to try to make your catechism our creed. We ask that you do not continue to defile the graves of our martyrs. So that was my introduction to reason writing. Okay, I came here to talk to you tonight, this evening, about, I'm going to sit here with this intimate little group, but much more comfortable, about the American Religious Civil War, and what I've talked about, uh, that is going on right now, like it or not. The most recent thing is over women's contraception. Remember this business? They want the church, the Roman Catholic Church, wants to make it so insurance companies do not have to carry or pay coverage for contraception for women. 
if it's against their religious principles. How about that? Now, it used to be, it used to be a lot different. Anyway, an interesting thing has happened. Xavier College, a Catholic university in Cincinnati, has suddenly decided we will stop contraception coverage. Now, when they were doing it for years before, it was no problem. It was not a moral question. It was not a violation of their moral rights to give women a contraception. But now, all of a sudden, with all of this talk going on, they suddenly decide that it is. And they said they ne it never should have been there, they say. Um, I have a bias here. I, I really do. I think that religion is harmful. I think it is an affirmative harm that does a great deal of damage to humanity. I think I'm a little bit overdressed for this audience. Um, so I'll get more comfortable. Have you heard about the atheist funeral? Atheist lying in a coffin. A sign says, here lies an atheist all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> That's, hello, sinner, come in, have a seat. I've got a number of jokes that my people who've heard me before, which are two, I think, they have to just bear through. They won't take that long. There was an atheist and a fundamentalist debating the issue of morals. You know, they think they've got a lock on morals or morality. That all morality comes from the Bible and all morality comes from God. Well, this is a fundamentalist says, darn right we fundamentalists are moral. He says, why, I didn't even sleep with my wife before we were married. Did you? And the atheist says, well, sir, I really couldn't say. What was her first name, her last name? Oh, <laughs> uh, well. I believe in blasphemy. Blasphemy, I have defined in my work, Bob was a blasphemy here, as the crime of making fun of ridiculous beliefs that someone else holds sacred. There are places in the world you can get killed for this. Places where superstition is valued over science and inquiry. And is there a way to set up the lights here for just a second? Can you do that? Okay. We're also coming up on Easter, by the way, you know. I got my water bottle here. Uh, Jesus turned water into wine, supposedly at Cana. Let's see, hit the lights, if you would, for just a moment, stand by. But I have this magical thing whereby I can't change the water into wine, but I can. But I've got to have the lights out to do it. No, more, 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 more. more like, yes, there we go. Look at that. Miracle. Okay. But you can see that's a miracle. What else could it possibly be? No wire. Okay, that's that's all. Let, let the lights back. <laughs> now notice when the light comes up, this will go off. Okay. Cute. Uh, Isaac Asimov, I think it was, who said that any sufficiently advanced technology, I, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology would seem like magic to the uninitiated. And this is absolutely true. What is magic and what is real? If I want to fly in an airplane, if the airplane is constructed exactly as it's supposed to be constructed, all of the things work, if the field, the service crew has done everything they're supposed to, and the pilot does what he's supposed to, and there's gasoline in it, and everything checks out, and they push start, the airplane will fly. It has no choice. It does, cannot decide whether it will fly or not. If those conditions are met, it must fly because of the rules of physics. Okay? Nothing magical about it whatsoever. Have you heard about the cult of the cargo plane? On one of the South Sea Islands, it was used as a base for Americans and British and others during the Second World War. A cargo plane, a DC-6, I think, came in periodically to bring supplies to this little community. And then it left. And then it came back and brought supplies again. The natives living there naturally thought that was a god. They'd never seen anything like it. They had no idea 
but they valued the nice thing that the god was bringing to them. At the end of the war, all of a sudden, the cargo plane stopped coming. So what did the natives do? They built an idol to the cargo plane, which I believe is still there. They worshiped the cargo plane, brought it gifts and uh, things to try to pacify the gods to make them come back again. So far it hasn't worked, but the belief still goes on. Do we have any of that sort of thing going on today? No. Heard about the World Trade Center cross case? Uh, this is a case of, that I'm the attorney, uh, together with a New York attorney, who filed a lawsuit against the New York Harbor Association. They, in the wreckage of 9-11, in a, a passageway, not, not a building, but in a passageway between two buildings, was found a structural element of two beams that were across from each other stuck into the ground that resembled slightly a Latin cross. A fundamentalist fellow saw this and he wrote to God's house with an arrow to it. People started coming there worshiping it. The name Jesus got carved on it. It was blessed. It's been sanctified. It was moved at the request of one friar, uh, Franciscan friar, uh, Brian Jordan, to the St. Peter's Church, a block or so from ground zero, installed on the pedestal in 1906, where it remained until it was time to open the memorial and the museum. When it was open, they took this, this cross, this artifact, this structural element, and lured it into the museum to be a feature in the museum on public lands paid for by we the people. American atheists and three named plaintiffs sued over this, and the case is now pending in the United States Federal Court in New York. And at the end of this month, uh, we're going to take some depositions in New York about this. Now, this is not a little thing like, you know, a little cross like this. This thing is 20 feet high, and it weighs 10 tons. And it's been modified. They shaved off the bottom. I say they circumcised the cross. They, they uh, cleaned it up a little. They've uh, trimmed the edges of it. And on one of the arms, you don't know what I You can see this on YouTube. Just put it World Trade Center across. On one of the cross beams, there is something draped. It is, uh, what it actually is, is melted ductwork material. But to them, it resembles the burial shroud of Jesus, or the shroud that was taken off of him at the time of the crucifixion. The Romans crucified people naked, by the way. They did not the way they do it. And um, the movies like The Passion for the Christ, we dig under it, and they did it naked. And this was hung on the side. And they felt that this was the Friday shroud, they call it. Now, they are actually saying that this is not religious. What, beloved, would it look like if it was religious? How would we make the artifact look religious if we wanted to pray to it, burn votives to it? I believe, I haven't been able to verify it, but I believe that it's been attributed to meet miracle cures as well. So they're going to put this thing in a national memorial paid for by we the people, and it's going to become another Lourdes for people to come and be saved and have miracle cures. So far, those who deal in miracle cures, however, have not seemed to be able to say that God cures amputees. Anybody known an amputee who's received a miraculous cure? You have blindness and stumbling and things like that, bad back. We, we get a little of the, the thing, and they push back on you, so you fall down, you've got a little ecstasy, a little more adrenaline, you walk out of there where you came in and it came. It doesn't last long, a couple of days or so. And then you're right back to it. But so far, God has not cured any amputees. Now, why is that? I tell you why, it's perfectly obvious why it is, because that's not what happens. It really is. And I believe it is dangerous to maintain otherwise. And that's what's going on in the American religious civil war. Now, there have been in American history two other great movements 
What was called the Great Enlightenment that occurred around the time of the Pilgrims. You know, the Pilgrims are those, those people in the black and the white hats that you kids color in Sunday school class while their parents are up at the sanctuary learning to be more judgmental. And the kids are coloring these things in. But these cute little pilgrims were among the most repressive religious types in the history of the world. They were kicked out of England, they went to Holland, they went to various other places, and finally they boarded a ship called the Mayflower and came here. And we still suffer from their heritage. It has been said that Australia got the convicts and we got the Puritans. And you can debate over who got the better deal on that. But, but that's what happened to the Puritans. And they brought with them their cup. You can, if you want to learn about the Puritans, read the book, The Scarlet Letter. That'll get it to you. Also, uh, the play, The Crucible. The kind of fanaticism that goes with this. I have been to the witch museum in Salem. By the way, there were no witches burned in America. If somebody tells you that, they don't know what they're talking about. They were hanged in America. They were not burned. And a lot of people were killed because of that. It appeared to be some kind of mass hallucination, probably caused by some fermenting grain or something in their food store. Uh, have you heard the song sung in some usually Protestant churches, Tell Me Why? You heard this, tell me why the stars do shine, tell me why the ivy twines, tell me why the sky is so blue, and I will tell you why I love you. And the refrain for the little children is to say, because God made the stars to shine. Because God made the ivy twine, because God made the sky so blue, because God made you, that's why I love you. And that's me. Well, the scientist and writer Isaac Asimov got to thinking about this. By the way, we know there's no afterlife because Isaac Asimov would have written about it if there was. He was a great science fiction writer and a, 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 he was a Russian fellow and a professor. Anyway, he looked at this little song and, and he came up with the following. Nuclear fission makes the stars to shine. Trophisms makes the ivy twine. Regulate scatter makes the sky so blue. Testicular harmony is why I love you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely dead-on accurate. If you can't explain something, blame it on a god. If some fact just won't fit, if learning's lamp is dimly lit, don't give up, do not quit, just proclaim that God did it. When I, when I, I read poems, I'm going to read you some here so you can tolerate it. Anyway, that was the first great enlightenment where people were, were signing up in droves. And interestingly, with all this stuff about Catholics, at that time it was illegal for Catholics to come into this country because they were afraid if they did, their church would try to take over and make their rules the rules for the country. And that was declared unconstitutional under the First Amendment. So in come the Catholics, and the Catholics are now trying to make rules for everybody. Uh, in conformity with their church. I don't know what else it could be than how can you have priests and bishops? And I'm, 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 I'm uh, an equal opportunity blasphemer. It's not just the Catholics, I'll go after anybody on this, but this is the current hot issue. The priests and the bishops of the church are telling people who to vote for and they're also telling legislators what laws they should pass and how they should pass them. They are. They're, they're being very, very open about it. Now, why are these people permitted to have a tax-exempt status and not pay taxes on their real estate while everybody's starving to death while they're trying to influence our law? Let me give you a greater question. That when I finally figure it out, I'm going to file a lawsuit, I think, against the Pope in the Vatican. Um, 
You see, the Vatican, as you know, is, is the head of the Roman uh, Catholic Church, and it's an enclave in Rome, completely surrounded by Rome, Italy, and it views itself as a separate nation. It has an embassy, it has their own army, their own guards, and the Roman Catholic Church has an embassy presence in the United States, so, and a presence of the United Nations. Now, why are they, under those circumstances, not required to register to vote as a foreign lobbying agent when they're trying to affect our laws? Run that up a flag pole and see who's leads. How about that? Why should the churches not have to pay taxes? President Ulysses S. Grant warned us about this when he left office. Have any of you read President Kennedy's statement that he made when he was running as the first Catholic to run for office? Please look it up. It was a speech given to a ministerial association that essentially says that I believe that separation of church and state in the United States is absolute. One of the candidates, Rick Santorum, says he makes him want to throw up when he hears that business about separation of church and state. He doesn't think it's separation at all. Next week I'm going to debate a, a uh, scholar, a law professor, fundamentalist uh, from, from some fundamentalist college on separation of church and state. And his topic, his theme is, what are all you secularists doing trying to interfere with our religion? And I think they've got it just a wee bit backwards. Article 6 of the Constitution of the United States, paragraph 3, says, there shall never be any religious test for any office under these United States. There shall be no religious test for any office under the United States. Now, what part of no don't they understand? <coughs> So why are we having religious tests? Why are we asking about Romney's religion? His religion is more, no more ridiculous than anybody else's. Uh, how is the Mormon system of, of people in around 600 before Common Era building a boat in Jerusalem, sailing it to America, and setting up a civilization here, and Jesus visiting them after his resurrection and preaching to them, and God punishing the bad people by making them look like Indians and killed off all the others, and that uh, a guy named uh, Mormon wrote this all down in a book that was buried by his son Moroni, who some centuries later comes to Joseph Smith, a convicted swindler on various uh, uh, dowsing deals and things, and uh, says unto him, I'm going to show you where these things are buried. And so he takes Joseph Smith there, and there are the old tablets written in something called Reformed Egyptian, and with them are some magic spectacles with which he can read the tablets and translate. Now, how is that any more weird than Jesus went into a tomb on Friday and came dead and came alive on Sunday, or any of the other things, virgin births and so on? Um, this is Holy Week, you know. I, I have a blog, by the way, if you wish to follow it, and certainly be appreciated every hit counts freethoughtblogs.com backslash cake. And I've been doing a little thing on what happened during Holy Week. This past Sunday was Palm Sunday, and that was the day that Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, and, uh, they threw, and he, he, he rode in on an ass, a donkey. They, he'd had his disciples steal from somebody, and so if they give you any trouble, tell them the Lord has need of it. So he's on this donkey riding into town, and people or throwing palm leaves in his path according to the story. By the way, I think the whole thing about Jesus is a myth. If, anyway, and we can get into discussions about that because uh, there are perfectly legitimate scholars who don't agree with me and think that uh, Jesus really was a real person there. There's evidence both ways. After coming into the city of Jerusalem, one of the Savior of the world's first official acts was to curse the fig tree. He comes up upon a fig tree and he's hungry and the fig tree is not producing any figs. We don't know whether it's fig season or what's the hell's the matter. 
Anyway, Jesus, to the objection of his apostles, curses this poor innocent fig tree, and it dies. Now, what's that doing in the Bible? That particular story has given theologians a lot of problems. They try to reason around it. It's pretty difficult to do. Also, okay, so we go from Sunday throughout the whole week. Yesterday was Wednesday, Holy Maudy Wednesday or something like that, and today's Holy Thursday. And during that period of time, among other things, Jesus raises a fellow 